Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Katrina Buhire. I go by Kat and I'm doing this presentation with uh, Bill Medill and Jan Medill. They happen to be my parents. Um, and this presentation is on a project that we've all been working on together that involves uh, painting that Jan has been do doing and then hardware and software that uh, as well as some woodworking um, that Bill and I have been working on together. Uh, the woodworking has been all Bill. I haven't been involved in that at all. Um, and so our hope today is to uh, get the slideshow going. There we go. Um, to give you a little introduction to who we are, uh, to go through the project. And as we're going through the project, we will be touching on all sorts of entertaining mistakes that we have made that hopefully um, will both have entertainment value but also educational value. So you can be aware that they are easy things to slide into. Um, and maybe we will also try and remember as we are continuing to work on this project and future projects to not do those mistakes again. But I'm sure some of them we will. Um, and then we're hoping we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for uh, questions. And we also have a slide of resources at the end for folks as they're working on their uh, projects. Uh, but before we get started, maybe we should bump that door shut. If they're having a party next door. Um, and they didn't invite us. They they didn't inv well, they did invite us. We were just <laughs> over here. Um, so the, uh, before we jump into who we are, I was hoping to just ask some quick questions of people in the room, if you're comfortable throwing a hand in the air, raising your eyebrows, uh, to just so we can get some better sense of who's in the room and what uh, each of your background are. Um, so how many people here play around with art? All right. Uh, people make things with wood? Some wood folks, nice. Uh, color theory people? All right. We have some color theory problems that we're not going to touch, in, touch on in this presentation, but are uh, definitely a part of this project. Um, lighting and LEDs? Folks who've played around with lighting and LEDs? Some, all right. Um, people mucked around with computer hardware? Hardware folks, uh, playing around with programming. And some programming folks, all right. So um, as we're going through, we uh, will try and slow down and explain things so they make sense, but feel free, feel free to throw your hand in the air uh, and ask a question right then or ask us questions uh, afterwards or come and find us in the hackerspace. We're gonna be there uh, probably early evening uh, today doing a little more work on this and, and playing with it with anyone who's interested. Um, so let's do a little bit of introduction. So this is Bill and me, uh, and I uh, did undergraduate in political science and then worked in nonprofits and then started a master's in library and information science at the same time that I started working with Bill at a web technology firm here in Portland and uh, got way into databases and information design and uh, building web applications together, which was a ton of fun and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I also started to miss the, the library and information science that I had been exploring. So about a year ago, um, started looking around and I'm now at Ecotrust as their knowledge manager. So I'm not actively programming much other than when I bash that internet into shape periodically and um, or ask people to do things that they don't want to do, but I know they can, so I use the special words. Um, <laughs> and one of the joys of getting to do this project, though, was getting to do another project with my dad um, and also getting to, to work with my mom, uh, collaborating with Bill at uh, Pixel spoke together for eight years was a ton of fun, and I really enjoyed it and learned a whole bunch, and so it was great to, to get to do that collaboration again, and because I'm more of a software person than a hardware person, it was really fun to get a little exposure to hardware, but that is not my background, as we will discover in some of the mistakes that I got to make. And I'm Bill. Um, my background is I started programming computers back in the late 60s. Um, when computers were big and had lots of flashing lights, which was what attracted me to computers in those, I thought, this is going to be great. It's a piece of machinery that I can control. And unfortunately, they've all shrunk down to things that are like 10 times more powerful and have one stupid light on them. And so um, I programmed for a number of years. And sometime in the mid uh, to late 70s, started moving into uh, software management and was an engineering manager um, at a number of companies around the Portland area, many of which were based in the Menlo Park. Uh, San Francisco uh, Peninsula. Um, so I got a lot of fun flying down in the morning on the uh, 6.30 Alaska flight and then getting to work before they did because they were trapped in traffic on the Bayshore. Um, 
and then uh, various companies came and went, and IBM kept kind of slurping up places I'd been, and eventually bought the company I was in at the time. I was at IBM for two years, uh, running this huge organization, most of the people I never, would never see because they were in other continents. And um, the opportunity came up to start this web development company with our son, Cameron, Kat's brother. So he and I started it, and we can run a whole other talk on how not to do a startup. Um, but we managed to grow the thing now. It's a, a marketing, digital marketing agency that's based around developing websites in WordPress. Um, we're about nine people. And we are in downtown Portland, so it's, it's kind of nice. And this is actually our, when we moved to our most recent office. And this may have been the victory picture. There's an earlier picture of me falling into a huge big pile of IKEA furniture boxes that after the end of a very long day that a cat took, but we couldn't find the picture. Uh, I think that's, so anyway, this is a chance. What I've been doing at Pixel Spoke is uh, non-management. I kind of had my fill of it, so I've been, it's back to programming roots. So when Cat showed up, I was sort of the walking PHP manual. You know, Bill, how does this work? Why do you do it that way? So it was kind of fun showing off some, some uh, programming stuff um, and doing some web applications. Again, some of which we made a lot of, learned, it was a lot of learning, let's put it that way. So. All right, on to the artist. Thank you. <laughs> Over here. Oh, hello. Nice to be fully documented occasionally. <laughs> um, I don't have time to give you much of an idea of who I am as an artist, uh, because that's really not the focus today. But I'll try to give you at least just a tiny little sense. Um, I'd also say that I'm happy to talk with anybody afterwards if you have anything you'd like to discuss. And I have my website up here, should you be interested in just seeing more and reading more about what I do. Um, I would say that in terms of my biggest interests, the themes really are breadth and interconnection and exploration. And so only in retrospect does this make sense to me, but I started doing series that kept getting larger and larger and larger, and finally ended up out in the universe, and had a great time doing my first universe-inspired series, but that wasn't enough, so I did another one. And then I also did a collaborative short film inspired by the second series, um, and all of that was really a fabulous experience in this amazing golden age of cosmology. But eventually, as things keep changing, it felt time to come back. So little bit by little bit by huge amounts, I started coming back to this teeny little speck that's Earth <laughs> and have much more of a sense of just how tiny this planet is. And as I kept in my mind seeing it grow and grow and having a sense of deep time, I could see all of the roiling of the Earth, the tectonic plates moving over each other, the volcanoes exploding into the air. And I realized I wanted to do a series that was geology inspired. So that was one of the things I did, but somehow or another, it kept getting interconnected, first with another series that's more inspired by human nature and psychology. And then that morphed into five series. And then a sixth and a seventh that is itself transforming right now. Um, so that's sort of the breadth of where I'm at right now. But jumping back now to geology, since that's really what our focus is uh, today. Um, one evening about dusk, Bill and I walked into my studio and looked at one of the geology inspired paintings. And it, it was, there was just, it was like, you know, the color was bleeding out. You know how it does when dust comes along. And then I flipped on the light. And all of a sudden, it was like the painting was transformed. Partly because a lot of these paintings have many kind of mosaic-like areas that are 15 or 20 or 25 layers of glazes, transparent glazes, intermixed with opaque, more three-dimensional, cliff-like areas and they respond very differently to the light. Um, then I thought, well, what the heck, I've got another light. I turned that on and it was like the painting was transformed again. So ultimately, that led to me applying for a grant to be able to get 
my two foreign collaborators to work with me, since I certainly don't have the skills to do this, to computerize lighting so that we could do something that kind of approximates a sunrise to full noon to sunset and dark. So that's basically what we've been working on. Um, and you know, a lot of you people seem like you're already quite skilled in lighting and thinking about colors. But I would just say, um, it might be something that you took in the back of your mind this week as you're in different places to just look at how different things and colors change throughout the day. I, I guess to me that's just sort of a source of never-ending fascination. So let's see, so the paintings that you saw then were, some of them uh, were from the geology inspired uh, paintings and the others from the more psychologically inspired ones. And then the sketch that's up here now shows you the initial idea, and I think there'll be many ways over time that these pieces can be shown, but a possible way, and this fits in with what Kat and Bill have been doing, um, is on all four walls potentially, although it could be one or who knows, um, there are, as you can see up there, nine paintings on the wall that change in size. Those are uh, representatives from the five psychologically inspired series. And then below that, down here, are two benches with two of the geology inspired paintings on them. And this is where we'll focus for the rest of the talk. Thank you. All right, so the whole installation will have four walls of this. And one of the things that we are thinking about uh, on this project is the art itself, but also what physical space it might be in. And so one of the things uh, that we're keeping an eye out for in the Portland area or probably more broadly, if a perfect space and opportunity arose, are uh, different places that this exhibit could go. Um, so one of the things that would be lovely is if anyone has any ideas or people who they think might have ideas, definitely give us a heads up, let us know. Um, and our contact information, I think, is on the website as well, but is on uh, the resources page of this slideshow, which we will upload to the wiki for the presentation uh, on the Open Source Bridge website. So, so art, space, and then light, which is the bulk of what we've been wrestling, Bill and I have been wrestling with uh, for the last nine months or so, and we're gonna walk you through it here. So, um, these are the primary components that we have been doing. Benches have been all Bill, other than my offering up helpful or not so helpful suggestions. Uh, and Jan obviously has lots of thoughts on the benches as well. The prototype here is only half the length of the bench. There would be two geology paintings and it would have legs. This one does not have legs. Um, and then the next component that we got into uh, was what will the LED lights themselves be? And what we settled on using our Blink M Maxims. Um, these are really fun little three LED lights that sit on top of what is the master, like, ah, like so. So this is what they sit on top of. And they are currently all absorbed inside that, so we will take it apart for you guys so you can see them. Um, so this is a little brain for it, and then we've got the little lights that make it bright. And the thing that was exciting about the Maxims is, A, they're programmable, so we could do whatever we wanted with them. Uh, we looked at some off-the-shelf solutions that will sort of give this, this going up and going back down light, and that wasn't as much fun, and also it didn't do exactly what we wanted, so we went this route. Um, and they are truly, really bright, which was the first mistake that we make virtually every work session that we sit down on, is to look into the light, and then we get little glowing lights in our eyes. So this is actually what I usually set over the top of it. So when it goes off, it just sort of glows. Um, and it's quite clear in the documentation, it's really bright, you should not look directly uh, into it. But we do. Um, the next component was we used the Arduino Uno uh, to do the programming along with its uh, little programming environment, the IDE. And that was all new to us, but I had purchased, and there's a cool little blue box floating around somewhere because they have these little kits for you. I'd purchased an Arduino kit. And so that was part of why we used uh, Arduinos. You don't have to use an Arduino with the, the Maxim. So if you've got 
something else floating around. You don't need to use it. But all of the documentation does tie back to the Arduino Uno, so that was very nice. Um, Bill, do you want to talk about power since you're the one that's had to wrestle with power? Yeah, so one of the artistic constraints, um, unlike a previous show where Jan wanted me to invent anti-gravity, this one was she wants enough power on the benches to push light onto these paintings in a gallery where there's no power to the benches, so it's all battery, has to be battery driven. So a, a power management is really going to be a tight little problem to deal with. Not convinced we have it sorted out yet, but I think we're on a good path. So um, there are various issues. I mean, the Arduino doesn't suck that much power. That's not the problem. The LEDs run at five volts. There's three of these guys. They'll draw 250 milliamps when they're at full power. So you do the arithmetic and you think, oh, I guess a nine volt battery is not going to do that. And you, know, you start to scale this up a little bit. Um, we're not quite sure how long to go between power recharges. And the batteries may turn out to be the most expensive part of this whole thing, except for the, the arts by the time we're done. But right now, what we're doing is just driving the uh, LEDs off of five volt wall, 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 wall warts for the time being. And um, there's four sets of LEDs off of each wall warts. There's an amp each. Um, at five volts, I mean, it's like trivial at room, you know, 120, it's like 0.6 amps, something like that. Um, beyond that, the idea is to have the lights all stay in synchronization. So there's another little piece of, we'll talk about things that need to be figured out yet, but uh, yeah. the standalone benches, we think we have everything working except for power. And then a couple other little things that um, we had to get pulled together. So uh, lots of little jumper wires, whatever you want to call them, uh, for hooking things together. And um, having a ton of them turned out being really helpful. That was a nice thing to have lots on hand from a couple different places that Bill and I had collected them with our fantasy of being hardware people. Um, and then uh, the breadboard. So this is the Arduino Uno here. And then this thing dangling is the breadboard. Um, and it's an easy way to hook things together without actually having to solder them. Um, and Bill and I both had breadboards that we were playing around with quite heavily. Um, so that was a good just thing to have on hand for a project like this. Um, we have ribbon cable and connectors that are hidden uh, right now and there, but we'll show those off in just a second. And um, the ribbon cable Bill discovered is not quite as flexible as he thought. So we'll, we'll show that little challenge. And then the final. Um, Thing that's of a yeah, it's a prototype. prototype. You find all the things that won't work. Yeah, um, and then the final thing is we have two programs. So getting into the software side that were used for this project uh, so far, and they will keep evolving. Um, so one of them actually is the instructions for the sunrise to the sunset, and then the second one is the instructions to get it to restart. Um, and you ready to do the demo? Sure. All right, so we'll see this in the demo. Um, we're going to fire the sucker off. And as I'm sure many of you know, demos are notorious for going awry. So we'll see if we have something exciting happen. But it was, has been going fine for the last couple of days. Yeah. And we'll keep it um, running for a little bit and then um, also have it set up in the hacker space. So. Um, sunrise the sun is rising and so it takes its own sweet time it's heavily red shifted on the early end shifts then to orange and then more into a yellow and then eventually blue comes in and it starts to make it much whiter and then the midday when they're both on full and the sunset is at this point the inverse of the sunrise so the the sunset guy will there there comes in the sunset set of lights and then as the programs, the, the, the two sets of LEDs are working independently, they're just counting down. It's very boring programming. <laughs> Oh, Jan was pointing out that the, the amount of ambient light in the room is sort of overpowering the, uh, the LEDs. I mean, we're throwing a bunch of light on the top of this painting, but it's just not uh, because of the, the angle of the light coming in the side and the fact that it's a uh, cloudy day, which really knocks the light around. Do you want to take your magical cake off now? Yeah, I can't do that and hold it. Yeah. 
All right, we're going to show the wizardry inside. Don't look straight into the lights, everyone. Yeah, so um, one of the, <laughs> this is tissue paper, prototyping, rock on. I mean, and frankly, if tissue paper works, tissue paper works, but it doesn't quite pull off what we're looking for. Um, so we have a field trip potentially this Saturday to a couple of the uh, filming supply companies around town uh, who sell all these great diffusers and gels for filming and theater productions, including two inch wide ribbons of it, which would work great um, for this general presentation. And then we won't have the, the tissue paper. So you can see the, um, these are the lights I was talking about. Oh, fabulous. It's being passed around. Um, and then this is the not as bendy as Bill was expecting, um, which I believe was causing issues with how you were angling the lights underneath the um, run there. They're quite directional. So the lights are quite directional. So there was a lot of fiddling trying to figure out the right way to connect it that would then hold its position. I went with some rather stiff wire for an initial prototype rather than trying to machine something that would be more reliable long-term in a gallery. Um, it turns out the ribbon cable is uh, kind of like kryptonite, so it was uh, knocking the lights off. All right, so while this guy is running along, we will have a few more slides to talk about the guts of what we, we put together here. Um, so this is basically a drawing of the, the full uh, Max M and on the top you have the master and on the bottom you have the blaster. Um, so the master's the brains and the blaster is the lights. And um, actually th the, this is a good comment for anyone who's diving in on these sorts of projects is there's tons of terminology involved in all of this and uh, you can still fully get it to work without necessarily understanding every magical word or using the appropriate uh, hardware term. Um, so don't get totally thrown by unfamiliar terminology and uh, both Bill and I at different points have latched on to words that we've liked but have not actually been the correct word and then figured that out six weeks later but we still have proceeded just fine. I was totally confused by sketches. Oh yeah, so when we get into the software we'll uh, talk about sketches which is another funny term. Um, so on this drawing there was one major lesson that, uh, maybe two major lessons that are touched on that Bill and I uh, discovered. The first is the documentation is really good for the maxims. We actually um, spent a lot of time making sad comments about, you know, things were just missing from the documentation, but in fact, we didn't uh, fully grasp what was being said in the documentation. So, reminding ourselves to reread the documentation over and over again, um, and particularly for hardware documentation, that oftentimes when they're talking about things, they're actually talking about, you know, that right there and I think I thought it was a more figurative rather than this actual literal we are talking about this physical point place um, so that's a more general lesson and we still keep coming back to the the data sheet which we have linked at the end and be like oh yes that now makes sense so you know our learning is getting deeper but is slow the small lesson uh, if you are wrestling with maxims is that there is this power selection jumper, which gets pulled out and pushed in here. It's a little black thing that you pull out and you push in. Uh, and so there's three pins and you just hop between the three. Um, if you are shifting where the power is coming from, you have to shift the power selection. Or it, won't work. it won't work, no power. <laughs> and I think we have now both done it two or three times, so I feel like I really know this lesson right now, but I will potentially forget it. And the one of the settings, if you put it on just one pin in one of the settings, because it's just, it's a null connection, it, it works just fine. You miss the pin on the other side and it doesn't work. And so you can get all confused when you're looking at these things backwards and trying to figure out which way you're supposed to run the jumper. This, okay, so this one is, this is also out of the data sheet. Like I say, very well laid out. Um, so this is, shows the, the blaster, the lights on top of the master, plugged into a breadboard and being driven by the Arduino. Now, the reason it doesn't plug directly into the Arduino is this thing takes so much power that you have to run it off the Arduino 5 volt uh, and ground lines over here. Um, you can't shunt enough power through the other pins to get the thing to work, which is also a lesson that we have learned and forgotten and learned and forgotten. So you, you plug it in, it doesn't work, and you think, oh, crumb, you know. The other thing is, it is very convenient to have enough jumpers with colors when you're not used to this stuff. 
So these are the bus control uh, wires to, uh, that actually talk from the Arduino to the programming of the master. And if you have jumpers with the right colors, you can actually wire it correctly. Um, it, it may not be obvious from this drawing, but the power and ground over here are switched in order from the power and ground over here. In spite of all the scary things in both the Arduino manual and the, the, the data sheet for the Maxim, these things are tough. I mean, we have grounded them. We've run five volts the wrong way. We've run nine volts the wrong way. Um, I've stepped on them and bent pins. I, yeah, I, and it's like, it keeps going. So uh, now they, these things may fry and all go up in smoke in two seconds. But it, you know, it, it, it's been very impressive about how much uh, abuse from somebody who's not, I mean, I was not wearing wrist straps. You know, I, I mean, I worked it until I got the lesson about static discharge problems. But these things I've just not been concerned yeah, about. Been a little lazy, so I'm waiting for us to fry one. Yeah, <laughs> the night before the demonstration. Yeah. Um, do you, oh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, so now an extension of the previous one was after you've got the master programmed, it can just run a string of LEDs. And in fact, off of this, it can run uh, just a regular old LED strip. Um, but in order to wire in multiple blasters, you do a little do -si do with the power. Um, we'd have to go back to the schematics to show you, but the issue is that um, you have to run five volts to each of these. If you use the onboard uh, power voltage regulator, you can't put enough power through it in order to drive multiple blasters. You have to run off of the external five volt DC. This was another lesson. It says five volts on the board. The data sheet says five volts come in. You plug nine volts into there, it doesn't work real well. Two of the LEDs come on, one doesn't. So, you know, you, you got to read the instructions and believe them. And, and we, you know, finally got that figured out. So the way I've got it wired here using ribbon cable is the same wiring that this thing does, where the power is coming off of this one pin here, but going into other pins on the uh, remote blasters. So the masters are down here tied to the Arduino. Um, there you have it. All the Arduino is doing is saying, this guy start, let it start to run its script, then a few seconds, well, 30 seconds later, it tells this guy to start. And they all run through it once, shut down, and then it starts over. And the reason is the clocks are not <laughs> very sensitive. You're, you're leaving the recording behind. Okay. Well, yeah. Anyway. Sorry. The Arduino is getting them to shut down and turn back on again, people who are listening later in the future, future people. Um, all right. Oh, and the one other thing for very basic uh, hardware stuff is all of these are exactly the same, just they're different in length and color. So when I very first started getting them, playing with them a year or so back, I thought maybe there was something significantly, di fundamentally different between a green wire and a red wire. Nope, they just have different colors on them. Um, figured out relatively quickly, but. Um, all right, so let's get into the software here. This was um, one of the discoveries that we made early on, which was part of why we decided to go with the uh, maxims, which is there's all sorts of fun functions that just come uh, baked in, which many of which we are not using, but we were entertained by these, and they're all nicely documented. There's both this table in the data sheet as well as a longer discussion of each of them. Additionally, and we haven't um, officially mentioned this uh, yet, but Todd Bot, aka Todd Kurt, has done lots of great work with these. He's sort of they're sort of his baby is what it seems like. Um, and both his uh, website, which we have a link to in the resources, as well as the forums, Toddbot pops up all the time and he's helping people out and has helped us out um, uh, both with the, the hardware and software side of things. So now we're diving into these sketches that were a little peculiar for mom when we first started talking about them. So the programs that run um, all of this are being run through Arduino up here, and Arduino's language is to call it a sketch. They call the program a sketch. Maxim's language is to call the program a script. So here's the little script in there. But it's just terminology, it's just all software. So um, you know, at different points, we got sort of tangled up on what was what. And because neither of us had done a lot of Arduino programming before, we also had to get familiar with, with this general interface. Um, and it's pretty straightforward to use you can do a little validation, and then this pushes it uh, from your running it on your computer over to Arduino. Um, and in the case of this one, there's also a serial monitor, which is a little pop-up screen that you can do some additional commands that it's 
further down on this one. Um, this code, we've been having arguments about where we want to put it in terms of GitHub or on one of our personal websites, but we will decide in the next 24 hours and update the wiki page on Open Source Bridge with how you can get the code. Um, and we'll try and have a couple back versions so you can see how it's evolved. Just want to stress, this is code written in the Arduino language, but it represents the script that is running on the masters. And so the Arduino is running C. This is baked in firmware commands for the master. Um, there's actually a guy that's got a whole different set of firmware for the masters that does other things too. Um, but we're using factory standard stuff. Someday we'll play. Um, and then this, uh, the Arduino is just acting as a, uh, an I2C master on the I2C bus, jams the stuff onto the master. It's, there's a little AVR microcontroller there, shoves it into its double EEPROM. And then whenever the power comes on, the master wakes up and starts to run its script. This is, so this is programming the masters. There's another program that we run that actually controls the masters. This one. Ah, this is the one that is a very complicated program. This it, is actually, I think, the whole thing. This is, uh, there might be one line further up, but. So all, all that happens, uh, you know, as a standard uh, Arduino program, there's a setup and a loop. Um, the setup, all it's doing is it's calling a subroutine that's defined in the, um, uh, the, this pile of functions here, the blink m funks dot h. Um, calls, tells it to come to life, and then it turns all of them off. It grabs, it's, it's come up as a, as a I2C bus master. It's shutting down the two devices, so because they have to have power first, so they come to life and light starts coming. So you quick shut down the lights, and then it goes into the loop where it fires off the first one, and it's basically saying, um, the one that's addressed as uh, hex A decimal 10, run your script once, and then it waits 32 seconds. It was a very carefully calculated amount of time. I started with 30 and decided, eh, make, let's make it 32. And then um, after that period of time, while this script is still running, because it's just gonna run once and stop, it fires off the second one. So that's how you get the overlap between the two. And after the first one's done, it's done, goes to sleep. The second one fired is, has been fired off, it runs through, it goes to sleep. And after, again, careful adjustment of this, um, and a beer later, that was 50 seconds, and so then it, the whole thing starts over. And um, just to call out two of the things that we uh, discovered as we were working on these. So um, the blink ums have a counter in them, and it's called ticks. And a tick is 1 30th of a second. But we did not initially realize that and I think independently at different points, both Bill and I programmed up some sort of fade loop where it was going like crazy. And then the whole thing would be over because there was only five colors we were, were cycling through. So that was a little gotcha. And then the other, it's very fast. Um, and there were so many other things we could have done wrong too. We weren't sure if it was the programming or if we had just miswired one of the, the little components here. Um, and then the other piece that Bill touched on, but was a very big got you for us uh, when we first started working with them, is that the scripts that sit on the maxims on that master come on when they are powered on. So we were loading them in just fine and they wouldn't run because they were power on scripts, which it said in the documentation, power on script, but that just didn't really mean anything to, to either of us at that point. And then I think one of us reread it and got it. Um, with the serial monitor, you can get it to do it without actually having to take the power off and put the power back on, but we've done it both ways. So those are two entertaining things we banged our heads against. Um, oh, and now we are to the highlight reel of the entertaining things we've banged our heads against. Okay, that documentation. Good old documentation, taking it literally. Um, power, so the um, switch that we were talking about early on, the five volt external power supply. Uh, and this was a thing that was interesting for me with hardware was I was more worth, used to with a program, it would just fail and fall completely on its nose. With hardware, it would oftentimes do things. And so I wasn't always clear like, was it doing what I had asked it to do or was it just going crazy? Um, so that was a, a little learning for me. Um, regulated power supply is tied to the, the five volt, whether it, can, it is actually regulating it to be five volts for you or if you need to do that. Um, look away from the lights, wire the boards correctly. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So don't wire them upside down. Um, and uh, these are all very standard things that everyone does. Um, the difference between the Arduino board scripts or sketches and the Blink M scripts, um, when we, we wandered around, did all sorts of crazy programming for a long time. The where and how to load the scripts, just learning um, how that Arduino uh, IDE, that interface we were looking at works, the ticks, um, power on scripts. And then two process things that we haven't touched on at all, um, but would have been lovely to do and we're still struggling with. One is taking as complete notes as possible as we were figuring things out. Part of the reason why we have redone so many of these mistakes over and over again is because we didn't do good notes and it would sometimes be six weeks by the time we would come back to a project. Um, and then uh, tied to that is because this was a side project, it was really hard to get dedicated ongoing time. You know, it's the sort of thing that if you sat down and you spent, we spent a week straight, we probably could get it all the way through, but instead we're doing evenings and weekends here and there. And that's just a reality of doing these kinds of projects. Um, more complete notes certainly would help, but so that's sort of the, the bind we're in there. Um, real quick, what we've got remaining is scaling this from our prototype to many benches. Um, syncing across benches, which we have some theories on, but haven't uh, fully tested it out. Yeah, so anyway, we've had entertaining. That would be something for the hacker space. Um, standalone power supply, getting rid of the wall warts down there. Um, the color choices and fading and also with diffusers and how that influences things. Uh, the latest version of the script is one that Bill has worked on. I've got a bunch of colors floating around. And it uh, also varies depending on what painting is sitting under there. And then finally, this venue. Uh, where are we going to do this, this big exhibit at some point? Bill, do you have anything else you want to add before we get into questions? All right. Question time. Do people have questions? <laughs> nice. The cost of them? I think they're 20 bucks. And you have to order them online, We were, or at least as far as we know. There's nowhere local to get them. Yeah. Yeah, there are companies that actually call Thin L. And then they have to screw your maker shows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, about 20 bucks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we've we've tried to do uh, planning for for the the sessions of like what is realistic for us to accomplish in this chunk, um, and that certainly helped. But we also slide off it and yeah. get distracted by something yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah, yeah. Do you know where you get those? Uh, Internet? Filipino market? Okay. Capiz? Okay. No. I don't think so.
Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The price uh, we do have to be sort of realistic with what <laughs> with our dollars. Yeah, thank you both. Um, other, any other questions or thoughts? So this is, this is more of a project that's built using open source resources and then hopefully making it available so if other people are working on similar projects. But at this point, we haven't really taken that next step to think about, OK, would other people be building on this other, other than, you know, here's an interesting use of it in and of itself. Um, I think sort of a community around using Blinkm, Maxim. Uh, Maxim was with the big brother in the original single board one LED product. There's a community that sprung up around that doing things with them. So we're hoping by adding this sort of stuff back into it that we can get other people to think of interesting ways to use the technology and potentially come up with much better scripts or <laughs> ideally we get a better firmware that would allow us to have better scripts running the lights. Um, but that's, yeah. it's all, that's all aspirational, I have to say. Yeah, no, no unfortunate large changing the world uh, movements with this one. Do you have any thoughts on things you would suggest on that front? Oh, um, I'm not sure. I haven't done any projects like this, this kind of thing. I haven't used Microsoft in a long time. But um, I was just curious if, like, because it seems like a, a way of displaying art that a lot of artists might want to use, but if we were creating, like, a sort of modular or a blueprint type approach where you could, you know. Yeah, I mean, certainly the script that does that allows people to think about fading lights that are timed and potentially syncing them up seems like it could be useful to other folks. Um, and we haven't really gotten to the point of, of figuring out how to distribute and share it more, more broadly. But um, that's a good reminder that we should. Ooh. No, I like that. If we can make people lay on the ground. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this has been us being, I mean, I think the sunrise and sunset also came from like, well, light changing, well, what about, you know, so, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of places that don't love to go with this. It's just sort of time sensitive. More progress made in the last few weeks. Yeah, the, the talk was a great motivator for getting things all together. <laughs> Yeah, the scaling will. 
next year at Open Source Bridge, we'll come back with that problem solved. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs>